starting the chapter on the ladder of self transcendence chapter 21 and we are on page 467 we are about to begin that page on the top of that page so for those who are coming in recently or for the first time we've got to this chapter after a sequence of chapters in which Sri Aurobindo has been dealing with the problem of the passive and the active Brahman. And he raises this problem at the beginning of this chapter as well, which is that we may experience the spirit, but it is usually experienced outside of life. And if we enter back in life, it is usually a separative ignorance in which we find ourselves. And we can bridge this to a certain extent, but not fully. And so here he raises this problem again, and he raises it, he has already actually, you know, touched on this earlier, the ladder of self-transcendence. And it relates to the fact that at the level of the human, there are ranges of consciousness and these ranges are not sufficient for us to be able to experience this overcoming of the divide between passive and active Brahman. And in a sense, if we as accepted our condition to be final, that is what we would have had to admit. But Sri Aurobindo's entire work starts from the foundation that it is possible for us to create new rungs in what he calls the ladder of self-transcendence. In other words, that whatever has been normalized in us through nature can be added to, modified. So there is a question of carrying on, as it were, what nature has undertaken through power of consciousness at the even at the individual level. So to do this, and we've touched on the fact that biographically, Sri Aurobindo encounters this in his own life. He starts off with the Nirvanic experience, which is really an experience of the passive Brahman. And yet, he is made to act in the world because when he has this experience, he's in the middle of the nationalist phase of his life. And it is as if something else is acting through him. He opens himself to this action. And it is only later when he's in the jail that he starts experiencing other forms of this spiritual reality. Uh, firstly, something which is universal, like an active Brahman, an active Shakti that has become the world. And then something which is imminent and is present at the center of every individual. But he's experiencing all these things separately. And even if he experiences them together, it is as if that, that totality has a certain kind of hierarchy to it. Something is privileged over other forms of experience. You may take any one of these and privilege it and include the others, but these others are secondary to one of these 
statuses of the spirit. So this problem, actually, it's interesting. I've just conducted or completed a workshop on the Isha Upanishad. And the Isha Upanishad identifies this very same problem in terms of what it calls knowledge and ignorance. Knowledge being the state of undifferentiated unitary consciousness and ignorance being the state of separative consciousness. But we find that the Isha Upanishad holds out the what is the goal of overcoming this problem as he, as they say it is to know the two in one or the know the two as one know knowledge and ignorance as one something that a state that does not erase cancel or subordinate either one of these two so then if one is to do that, <clears throat> how does one do that and what makes it possible? This is a question that the Isha Upanishad addresses in a very cryptic way because it is, of course, a very concise um, <clears throat> Upanishad. And the only pointer we may find in it is that it calls to the power of the solar godhead it's like a prayer it's an aspiration calling to what is called the fosterer pushan in the vedic image of uh, one of the solar gods the fosterer of pushan is invoked and its grace is, you know, besieged so that it may remove what is called the golden lid. So this notion of the golden lid, which stands between our existence and the overcoming of this divide between the passive Brahman and the active Brahman, um, is what is preventing the golden lid is what is preventing this full experience. And as I said, it seems as if if we are to take ourselves as we are, this would be our condition. Now, we can ask whether there is any logical uh, ground for supposing this. And in fact, there is a logical ground for supporting, supposing this. And that logical ground is logic itself. It is so because the golden lid is really the lid of the mental consciousness. The mind with a capital M, like a cosmic mind, is that which casts its one would say a phenomenological boundary to experience. And it does so because that is the level till which nature has unfolded its consciousness. And the problem with that is the problem of logic. In other words, everything is perceived in terms of the mental laws of exclusive logic. See, it's an either or consciousness. So it's either if Brahman is passive Brahman, then the situation with multiplicity and with the becoming is subordinate or secondary at best. And illusionary at worst. See? And this is how traditions have seen it. However, if you take the notion of Shakti, that is that there is a power of Brahman active in and as the universe, 
then we find that that becomes the primary aspect of the Brahman, of God, of, of being. And the other aspects, for example, the transcendent outside or the individual immanent become either absent or secondary and subordinate. See, that's why today we have so many philosophies of becoming which is good because it's it's a turn towards the affirmation of our existence on earth but still most of them are couched in exclusionary terms themselves there is a becoming but the being is either subordinated or subtracted Let's see so Sri Aurobindo is asking the question as to whether it is possible to overcome this condition and looking back at something like the Isha Upanishad, one would say if it is to be overcome, it can be overcome only by a power which is beyond the golden lid as it is called in the Isha Upanishad. Now, Sri Aurobindo does not refer to the golden lid in this work but the way in which he approaches it is to talk about the different forms of relation that we find between the conscious being and its world which is in the sankhya image known as purusha and prakriti this is a, a, a kind of a extension of the Sankhya idea applied to the Vedantic or Upanishadic knowledge of the Taittiriya Upanishad that there are rungs of this ladder of consciousness and at every rung there is a conscious being and its relations with the world in which it finds itself or which in a way it has created. So that is what Sri Aurobindo is discussing at this point. He has started off by talking about this problem and then he has begun speaking about the lowest rung, which is matter, as a certain kind of relationship between conscious being and its world. So that's where we find ourselves. Let me see here. Uh, so that's where we find ourselves. Um, in page 466, he begins by talking about this relationship of the material consciousness or the physical consciousness, which in the Taittiriya Upanishad is called Annamaya, Annamaya Sharira, the, the body of, of, of matter, or literally speaking, the body of food. The body of food, it's, it's a very interesting characterization of the physical existence. The physical existence is upheld by physical consumption. And we must not forget that the physical existence is itself food for something or someone. See, so we are, we are ourselves at the physical level upheld by food and we are at the physical level food for someone or something. This is the very nature of physical existence, which is why it is called also the existence of the food being, the being of food. So that's what he's discussing in page 266, 466, sorry. Um, and there he talks about the relations between conscious being Purusha and nature at the physical level of Prakriti, he calls the two soul and nature and tries to discuss what is this relation 
at that level. And he says, spirit is absorbed in its experience of matter. It is dominated by the ignorance and inertia of the tamasic power proper to physical existence. This is again terminology that he is deriving out of Sankhya, where nature or prakriti exhibits three kinds of qualities or gunas and the quality proper to matter is tamas. So this is the power which dominates the expression of the world at the level of matter and the soul, the conscious being, accepts that and experiences the world in those terms. So from there, um, we move to, he says, towards the end of that paragraph, he says, spirit itself in matter is limited and divided in its self-relation and its powers by the limitations and divisions of this matter-governed and life-driven mind. This materialized soul lives bound to the physical body and its narrow superficial external consciousness and it takes normally the experiences of its physical organs, its senses, its matter-bound life and mind with at most some limited spiritual glimpses as the whole truth of existence. So this is the experience of the physical being or the physical soul. So page 467 is where we will start from that point on. Man is a spirit, but a spirit that lives as a mental being in physical nature. Uh, Debashish? Yes. Uh, I'm having a question regarding this, uh, what you said, something which you said in last uh, lesson, and uh, I'm seeking a clarification on this. And if I may just try to recapitulate uh, to see whether I got this straight. It's regarding the, uh, you said that in last lesson that uh, Sri Aurobindo makes a distinction between Jivatman and Antaratman. Uh -huh. And uh, the way I understood it is that um, the Jiva, the Jiva is our idea of, of self, uh, and that is in time. Our, our self, the idea of ourselves as a human being and uh, as a creature, and that is in time. And behind that is the Jivatman, which is timeless. And uh, this is, the Jivatman is our essential self, timeless, with a capital S. And now the Antaratman, on the other hand, is also our inner self. It is also our inner, our inner being, uh, a soul, a sentient soul. And uh, you even said that it is correspond as an Upanishadic term. The Antaratman is an Upanishadic term, which would correspond to the psychic being of Sri Aurobindo. Now, my question is, is this Antaratman, is it... Uh, timeless, also timeless, with a capital S, or is it in time? And uh, because it seems to be uh, an inner self of all beings, and that is my question, where exactly is this distinction that Sri Aurobindo makes between Jivatman and, and Antaratman? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't recollect where he makes the distinction, but uh, also I would like to qualify a little bit what you said. Uh, so the term jiva, sometimes in Sri Aurobindo's letters, he will say jiva is the same as jivatman. But this is, of course, sometimes. And these are semantics. So if we think about all the various uses of the term jiva in Indian 
in our literature, spiritual literature, jiva is sometimes used as equivalent to the individual prakriti. Jiva, you use the word creature, and that indeed is like the way in which it is used in a number of places. So as creature, jiva is the individual prakriti. But Sri Aurobindo also uses the term jiva sometimes to be equal to jivatman. So this is a distinction. You know, it's not the same as the normal use or sometimes use of the word jiva as creature. So if jiva, so let's put jiva aside because it will complicate the issue. So jivatman, yes, jivatman, he, Sri Aurobindo is very clear that Jivatman is outside of time and space. It's before, prior to manifestation, as it were. So it's the self with a capital S that is universal but individualized. And how are we to understand that? We have to understand that as you know, this is this, we have used this term, and this term occurs in Western philosophy as well, complicated and perplicated. In other words, the one soul can perceive itself, it's a multiple self-concentration of the divine on itself. It can perceive itself as the totality of its own possibilities in a certain way, through a certain perspective, as it were. But it doesn't, neg it, it includes everything, but it's a certain perspective. So this perspective gives birth to a sequence of qualia, you know, the qualities by which it manifests itself. It doesn't mean that these qualities exclude any qualities but they foreground certain qualities in a certain sequence. So this would be something like the blueprint of what enters into time and space from life to life. That would be the Jivatman. Now, Sri Aurobindo uses the term psychic being. Actually, the mother uses the term psychic being for the soul person, you know, the inner, the innermost person, as she says, the term person is more true of Purusha rather than Atman. Atman is self. So the thing is that when we are talking about Antaratman, which is a term that is used both in Katha Upanishad and the Gita, we are talking about an imminent aspect of the, aspect of the jivatman this jivatman which is outside time and space has entered into a life and a birth as the antaratman so as an antaratman it is an individual self but it is an individual self that is experiencing within time I would say, therefore, that it is the self of the psychic being. Psychic being is a term that is used for a purusha, a person, a person within us, the true person within us. This true person, this idea of the psychic being is given to us by Mother and Sri Aurobindo from her for a very specific reason. The reason it is given is that that is the image which can mold our nature into itself. You see, that image through which we can be transformed in our nature into an individual, into a divine individual. Our image, which molds our image of ourselves into ourselves. Did you say that? 
into a divine yeah into a divine mold okay. our mold in, our uh -huh. our nature okay into a divine image of ourselves yeah so that particular person has a self so purusha has a self that self is antaratma Uh, could could one say can we understand it also as a kind of a substratum underlying substratum, substratum or is that too is that too you could call it essence or you could call it essence of self you see like what is the self this idea of the self uh, idea of the self you know i mean it is a self we we use that idea because we have a self so we may say the divine has a self we use the term paramatman in upanishads they don't use the term para, paramatman they use the term atman and atman in the upanishads stands for the transcendent self the universal self and the individual self it's the self so but both jivatman and antaratman are actually an essence of self right yes but antaratman has entered into time experience okay has entered in, so it is in time it is not timeless it is timeless in time in so, timeless in time. yeah i got yeah i see i see okay yeah. That was the what I what I was looking for, right? Right. I so the, it is. You may say that the the conjunction between that which is timeless and that which is in time. So when we when we talk about temporal eternity, you see this, this. When we talk about the psychic being, the psychic being experiences a temporal eternity. In other words, the psychic being. This is again we are, we were talking about the Isha Upanishad. This is something very principal to the Isha Upanishad. That there are two kinds of eternity. One is the fact that we are like a river, inexhaustible river that goes from life to life without end. In a becoming that is timeless, it's time beginningless and endless. That is the psychic existence. The self of that existence is the antaratman. Okay. Yes. Thank you so very much, Devashishi. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Merci. Okay. Yes, Linda. I just had a, a real quick question. Um, a few minutes ago, you were making a distinction between the Purusha and the self, the self with capital. Can you just say a tiny little bit more about that? What's the difference? Yeah, Purusha is person. And person has quality to it. Self has no quality. Self, when it assumes quality, becomes Purusha. This is the, the way the Aitariya Upanishad begins. It begins by saying, it's sort of in a way biblical, because it says, self brooded upon the ocean of qualities and drew out from there person. You see? So self, if you think about self, if you ask yourself, you know, what is self, you come to an essence, something which is essential, something without instrumentation, just the knowledge of yourself. And that self becomes more and more essential till it becomes the universal self and the transcendental self. So self in its essence is without quality. The quality that pertains to your own existence 
is the quality of yourself as a person. Justin. Um, Devashish, you said that there are two kinds of eternity in the Isha Upanishad. One is the river that goes on and on from life to life without end. Yeah. Is the other the endless? What is the other kind of eternity that you were speaking of, please? The other eternity is that which is never enter entering into the manifestation that the Isha Upanishad calls yeah. the non-birth. The non-birth that which is never born and that's the antaratman no oh Th that that in the case of the individual that is the jivatman okay aditya so uh, actually uh my question is kind of related to what we just uh, just mentioned. So Jivatman is never, I thought Jivatman and Antaratman are both present in us. And Antaratman is the evolving being trying to express the Jivatman with, which is within us. Is that correct? Or... Yes, it's correct. Yes, it is correct. Antaratman is the individual self that is within the manifestation and trying to express the Jivatman and it does so by assuming the purusha into itself and that that purusha is a has got qualities to it and so that purusha is what sri aurobindo and the mother are calling psychic being antaratman is the self of the psychic being as at least as i understand it i haven't actually come across this specific distinction that i'm trying to make in the writings of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. It would be interesting to see what they say if any of you find it. But uh, that's how I extrapolate their work to talk about and, Antaratman. Uh, one, just one follow-up question. So is the Antaratman tied to the mental being in individual? Is it like one Antaratman per... Uh, is it like that or... Yeah, the Antaratman is unique to every individual, but not the mental being. It's behind the psychic being. Okay. Mental being will be, you know, the Manomaya Purusha, Manomaya Atman, etc. You see? That in fact, that mental being is what is usually called uh, Purusha in Sankhya because Sankhya uses the mental phenomenological apparatus to define Prakriti and hence Purusha becomes the outside of that Kika So, um, what you said about this um, um, self uh, brooding over the ocean of qualities and to draw out um, the Purusha, that was such a beautiful image. Um, so, immediately it kind of uh, made me contemplate and from that this question is coming. So, um, I was um, thinking of, you know, Brahma, Vishnu and Maheshwar. Um, this idea that if I um, forget it, actually, there's no need to bring those names. Um, so this ocean of qualities, I was thinking that the um, the Visha, Visha Rupa or the, the Mahapurusha, that, that the universal Purusha in a way. Um, so if, uh, if, we think of that as a constant or eternal uh, poise of the absolute, and um, and that said, uh, if we think of this ocean of quality, is kind of an ocean itself is like a purusha, 
that way, which is holding all possible qualities. And, and then drawing out of um, the ocean to create Purusha, it sounds more like individual individuation, uh, the creation of the individuals. Uh, can you elaborate on that or is it? It's possible. Um, I I was thinking, I mean, I have to think about it because this Vishwarupa idea, idea of the Vishwarupa, which is actually, you know, given as the union of the Supreme Purusha and the Supreme Prakriti, right? It is Purushottama and Paraprakriti in union. So this ocean is, I was always thinking about it as the Paraprakriti, see? And Atman is really like a mirror, you see, by which uh, para prakriti is turned into a, a certain kind of a purusha. So this purusha, when we are talking about the ocean of, of, of qualities, uh, whatever we express in cosmic qualities is only a part of that. See? So that there are many qualities that we can't even name we don't have the ability to name. So we can say that this is where the notion of real idea comes in for Sri Aurobindo, that uh, the cosmos is a real idea that has extracted a purusha, a cosmic purusha out of this transcendental paraprakriti. So you could say, as you said, that this is a infinite purusha, a vishwarupa purusha, uh, but you would have to say that it is as much an infinite prakriti as an infinite purusha. And the Atman that is being talked about here, because the Atman in this Upanishad, Aitiriya Upanishad, it is a creation myth. So it is really creating the cosmos. And so it is drawing out of that the qualities with which the cosmos is seeded. And hence it is creating, one may say, the cosmic purusha out of the uh, transcendental purusha prakriti, ocean. So uh, the cosmic purusha, can it be, are, are, uh, are you trying to say that there could be many cosmic purushas um, that can be drawn out uh, or is it um, the one and the only one? Um, firstly, yeah. then before yeah. that, I was thinking that, you know, para, when you say para prakriti, it is, it means that it is not separated from, yeah. from the transcendent, right? So, um and okay, so getting back to this, um, this if something has to be drawn out, uh, it is something that it immediately ha gives an implication that there can be more, you know. So um, that way, if we we are already saying that the cosmic purusha is one of many possibilities. No, we could say that the cosmic purusha is one. But the unmanifest possibilities that are not included in the cosmic purusha are also latent in it. You see, it's in other words, what is drawn out of the ocean is drawn out by the Atman that is not separate from Atman. That's why in some in Kashmir Shaivism, this image of the Atman will be like a mirror. See? So para prakriti will pull out a partial mirror by which to see herself. And by seeing herself in that mirror, she takes on a certain image, the image of the cosmic purusha. Now, that image of the cosmic purusha, however, contains the latency of those things that have not been pulled out. So um, the latency, being, okay. Yeah. But that cosmic <laughs> being has the possibility of expressing something that has not yet been pulled out. So, um, unmanifest, um, can it be called um, 
quality as yet? Or... I don't know, maybe not. But uh, say, for example, when we talk about infinite qualities, the term infinite itself is something that goes beyond numer numerical qualities. So the possibility of more qualities, you know, a radically infinite number of qualities that we cannot call qualities at this point, see, but that possibility is contained in that idea. So you meant to say an ocean of consciousness, kind of like yeah, an ocean of consciousness, but consciousness, consciousness can modulate itself into yes, ideas. yeah. Thanks. Wow. I'm not sure there's more to be gained from any question before. I'm just trying to absorb all of those distinctions. Um, before this last round of questions, you said something about a self without qualities. And that just made me, I couldn't imagine a self without qualities. But I've gotten a lot since then from Keika's question and your answer to it. So I think we should just leave it there. And yeah. no, unless there's something, something else you want to say about a self without yeah, quality. Right, right. So because I think the way in which the idea of self is being developed right. is that it is a pure observer. So it is a pure observer that is just a point without qualities. And therefore, it you know uh, that that they're trying to say that there can be a poise of the spirit that is like that, you know. In but, fact, but that's that's the unmanifest divine. I mean, that's it's, you could say it's the sat. Yes, you could say it's the sat. Yes. Yeah. the sat in which the chit is latent. So okay, that I got. <laughs> you could say something like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Justin. The avyaharanam, avyaharanam in, in the Mandukya Upanishad, is, perhaps is that word? I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, but avyaharanam, unspeakable uh, kind of condition of, of the un, uh, un, un, undisclosed. But, the, the, but, but I wanted to ask about Samkhya and, and, the sense of, I mean, how much it, it really comes into enumeration uh, of, of bring, I mean, of desha, jati, desha, kala, of all of the, I mean, and of how that enumeration creates a sense of finitude as a practice in, in if, if Samkhya is doing that, is that enumerate, is that, is that, and how does that then relate to that infinite that seems to be also expressed? So Sankhya is creating a, a certain kind of a, you know, context of experience. See, we experience uh, within a context and within also the nature, the, the qualities that we have inside that context. You see, so now this is again that whole notion of uh, publication and complication. In other words, those qualities, however, contain within themselves in their latency qualities that we cannot know or that have not been expressed, whether in ourselves or you know, outside ourselves. So when we are talking about enumeration of these, uh, you know, these aspects or elements of, of, of our nature, and talking about the qualities of these, uh, we are still talking about something that is limited, but that can be held to have in its latency other things that we cannot talk about. So in Sankhya, the problem with the enumeration of Sankhya is that it's really a technology. It's a praxis. So what Sankhya is saying is that we can reduce ourselves to these this description and we can enumerate this description and doing so we can find an outside to that. See, 
but it is not trying to tell you that this description is an absolute description. It is just giving you a, a handle for praxis. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so maybe we can uh, start reading. Man is a spirit, but a spirit uh, that lives as a mental being in physical nature. And maybe, um, Margaret, would you like to take us there? Sure. Man is a spirit, but a spirit that lives as a mental being in physical nature. He is, to his own self-consciousness, a mind in a physical body. But at first, he is this mental being materialized, and he takes the materialized soul, Anamaya Purusha, for his real self. He is obliged to accept, as the Upanishad expresses it, matter for the Brahman, because his vision here sees matter as that from which all is born, by which all lives, and to which all return in their passing. His natural highest concept of spirit is an infinite, preferably an inconscient infinite, inhabiting or pervading the material universe, which alone it really knows, and manifesting by the power of its presence all these forms around him. His natural highest conception of himself is a vaguely conceived soul or spirit, a soul manifested only by the physical life's experiences bound up with physical phenomena and forced on its dissolution to return by an automatic necessity to the vast interminateness of the infinite. But because he has the power of self-development, he can rise beyond these natural conceptions of the materialized soul. He can supplement them with a certain with a certain derivative experience drawn from supra-physical planes and worlds. He can concentrate in mind and develop the mental part of his being, usually at the expense of the fullness of his vital and physical life. And in the end, the mind predominates and can open to the beyond. He can concentrate this self-liberating mind on the spirit. Here, too, usually in the process, he turns away more and more from his full mental and physical life. He limits or discourages their possibilities as much as his material foundation in nature will allow him. In the end, his spiritual life predominates, destroys his earthward tendency, and breaks its ties and limitations. Spiritualized, he places his real existence beyond in other worlds, in the heavens of the vital or mental plane. He begins to regard life on earth as a painful or troublesome incident or passage in which he can never arrive at any full enjoyment of his inner ideal self, his spiritual essence, Moreover, his highest conception of the self or spirit is apt to be more or less quietistic. For as we have seen, it is its static infinity alone that he can entirely experience, the still freedom of Purusha unlimited by Prakriti, the soul standing back from nature. There may come indeed some divine dynamic manifestation in him, but it cannot rise entirely above the heavy limitations of physical nature. The peace of the silent and passive self is more easily attainable, and he can more easily and fully hold it. Too difficult for him 
is the bliss of an infinite activity, the dynamis of an immeasurable power. So the first and most interesting thing, I think, is how he starts this by calling the human being, man, as a spirit that lives as a mental being in physical nature. At least that's how we first experience our existence. And that, again, we must remember that when Sri Aurobindo is writing this, uh, he is not foregrounding the notion of the psychic being as the essence of the human. He is foregrounding the fact that the human expresses the third rung of the evolution of Prakriti, which is the mental being. So just as we were saying that there is a certain kind of cosmic, you know, over-determination of all of nature by mind with a capital M. Um, so to the soul of that particular way of experience is the more proper essence of the human. That's how Sri Aurobindo sees it at this point at least. So the mental being the human in that sense is that particular manifestation of nature that is expressing its psychic existence through the mental being, its soul, a soul of mind. And so that mental being finds itself in matter. So it's a mental experience of matter that we are having. This is what he's trying to say over here. And then he says, when we do that, we take this materialized soul, Annamaya Purusha, for our real self. And when we do that, then we take matter to be Brahman. So, And then matter as Brahman means for us that you know, the, the primary, I mean, as, as in our times of materialism, right? Materialism as a philosophy, actually, which is that matter is the primary reality. All other realities are based on matter. See? So that, that becomes the way in which the human perceives its conscious existence. Our conscious existence is a material existence. Consciousness is existing within matter or as a property of matter. And then if it is to think about an infinite, that infinite is going to be the infinity of matter. See? So Sri Aurobindo draws attention to the Taitiriya Upanishad over here where in Brigo's Tapasya, uh, the first answer to what is Brahman by Brigu is that matter is Brahman, Annam Brahma. And he's saying this because in a way, this materialized uh, infinity, uh, you know, that matter as an infinity is what it is experiencing as the totality of existence. We think about that as the totality of existence. So that's where it begins. Okay? But as he's pointing out over there, the mind cannot dwell there forever. Beyond a certain point, it starts experiencing disgust. And that's the point he's making, that then it tries to look for an out. And it starts concentrating on non-material realities like vital realities and mental realities. That happens at an individual level. And when it happens, it loses its grasp on matter. This again is a, is, is a consequence of that 
logical exclusionary property of mind. If mind puts its concentration on life, it loses its hold on matter. If it puts its concentration on matter, it loses its hold on spirit or mind or life or whatever other properties. See? So this is how he's saying that we experience our existence first to be a materialized existence and then try to look out and lose our hold on matter but gain something outside it. Swaha. Yeah, I got all that. The one thing is when he said his natural highest concept of spirit is an infinite, preferably an inconscient infinite, inhabiting or pervading the material universe. Why would any kind of preference be an inconscient infinite? I don't understand that. I can't hear you. You're muted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I was saying, if the consciousness assumes that matter is the primary reality, then it looks for the infinity of matter as its idea of an infinite spirit. And because matter is inconscient, okay. it experiences that as the infinity of spirit, as an inconscient infinite. Because I would want whatever was pervading to be conscious <laughs> myself. Of course, but... <laughs> of course. So that, that's the, the point he's making is that that's our first beginning uh -huh. when the mental being experiences itself as totally encased in matter and matter to be the primary reality. Now, it, as he says, it can't take that forever. So at a certain point, it starts wanting out of it. Once it has built its own imprisonment in matter, it starts thinking, how can I get out of this? And it does that by various forms of alienation, whereby it you know, tries to get rid of its hold of matter uh, and uh, puts its focus on other forms of consciousness, ultimately an outside. So, you know, this is the, the story in a way of um, most spiritual systems where there is a certain kind of a assumption of a imprisonment, uh, a hold of either material existence or a matter life mind compound and a sense that that is an imprisonment after a certain point we have to go out considering a spirit that is not yet manifest to be that which will give us the truth of our existence i felt that almost from birth so i understand that whole thing very well So he's saying that the, essentially there is a division. So either he's stuck in understanding matter as the truth of existence or he, because he says, because he has the power of self-development, he can rise beyond these natural conceptions of the materialized soul. He can supplement them with a certain derivative experience drawn from superphysical planes and worlds. This is also interesting, the derivative experience drawn from supraphysical planes and worlds. And this is because to start with, we are mental beings. This is the point he's making, that we are mental beings. We experience a materialized or physical existence, and we take ourselves to be physical beings. We are mental beings taking ourselves to be physical beings. Then we become mental beings, taking ourselves to be mental beings. But 
we are doing so with experience from certain other planes. And these supraphysical planes give us an idea of something beyond us, but it becomes an imaginary idea. It's derivative. It is derived because we are mental beings. We have not actually changed our consciousness into something higher. We are taking into the mind that which we are holding ourselves to be. So we are creating images, whether of the superphysical realms or of a materialized e existence. So those superphysical derivative images then are brought into our materialized existence and that of it which cannot you know, be materialized becomes the ground for some kind of an escape. You can supplement them with a certain derivative experience drawn from supraphysical planes and worlds. He can concentrate in mind and develop the mental part of his being, usually at the expense of the fullness of his vital and physical life. And in the end, the mind predominates and can open to the beyond. He can concentrate this self-liberating mind on the spirit. So this is this is the point that one can do that, but one loses something. You see, either you have this or you have that. This is the kind of dilemma through which mental existence puts us. So let's read on. He's saying, of course, that this is not, I mean, the condition of holding the mind in material existence to be the primary uh, reality is not necessarily the only way in which we can take ourselves. We seem to take ourselves like that, um, particularly in, in our times, which is a time of materialism in a philosophical sense, um, we can take ourselves like that. But we have taken ourselves in other ways, like what he'll talk about next is where the soul of mind takes itself to be a being of life. And that's the whole philosophy of vitalism, for example. Vitalism or animism uh, takes our existence as an existence that is created around the forces of life. So maybe we can move to read that. And Linda, would you like to read that paragraph? Yeah, sure. Okie doke. Okay. But the spirit can be poised. Is that where we are? Yes. But the spirit can be poised in the principle of life, not in matter. The spirit so founded becomes the vital self of a vital world, the life soul of a life energy in the reign of a consciously dynamic nature. Absorbed in the experiences of the power and play of a conscious life, it is dominated by the desire, activity, and passion of the rajasic principle proper to vital existence. In the individual, the spirit becomes a vital soul, pranamaya purusha. 
in whose nature the life energies tyrannize over the mental and physical principles. The physical element in a vital world readily shapes its activities and formations in response to desire and its imaginations. It serves and obeys the passion and power of life and their formations and does not thwart or limit them as it does here on earth where life is a precarious incident in inanimate, in inanimate matter. The mental element too is molded and limited by the life power, obeys it, obeys it and helps only to enrich and fulfill the urge of its desires and the energy of its impulses. This vital soul lives in a vital body composed of a substance much subtler than physical matter. It is a substance surcharged with conscious energy, capable of much more powerful perceptions, capacities, sense activities than any that the gross atomic elements of earth matter can offer. Man too has in himself behind his physical being, subliminal to it, unseen and unknown, but very close to it and forming with it the most naturally active part of his existence. This vital soul, this vital nature, and this vital body, a whole vital plane connected with the life world or desire world is hidden in us, a secret consciousness in which life and desire find their untrammeled play and their easy self-expression and from there throw out and from there throw their influences and formations on our outer life. So in a way, this is a, a, a continuation of what he's saying about the physical existence, but translated now to a center, which is that of the life world, the world of life, or of the vital uh, vital energies uh, of, the, of the world, of the cosmos, taken to be primary, so to say. Perhaps we can continue since, uh, you know, it is really a, a transposition of the same idea. And we can just see how uh, the way in which the mental soul can put itself into these various forms of experience and take them to be the centers of its own existence. So the next paragraph, perhaps, and uh, maybe if uh, Anastasia, would you like to read this next paragraph? Yes, sure. Am I audible? Yes. yes. In proportion as the power of this vital plane manifests itself in man, in man and takes hold of his physical being, this son of earth becomes a vehicle of the life energy, forceful in his desires, vehement in his passions and emotions, intensely dynamic in his action, more and more the rajasic man. It is possible now for him to awaken in his consciousness to the vital plane and to become the vital soul, pranamaya purusha put on the vital nature, and live in the secret vital as well as the visible physical body. If he achieves this change with some fullness or one-pointedness, 
Usually it is under great and salutary limitations or attended by saving complexities. And without rising beyond these things, without climbing to a supra vital height from which they can be used, purified, uplifted, he becomes the lower type of Asura or Titan, a Rakshasa in nature, a soul of sheer power and life energy, magnified or racked by a force of unlimited desire and passion, hunted and driven by an active capacity and colossal Rajasic ego, but in possession of far greater and more various powers than those of the physical man in the ordinary, more inert earth nature. Even if he develops mind greatly on the vital plane and uses its dynamic energy for self-control as well as for self-satisfaction, it will still be with an Asuric energism, the Pasya, although of a higher type and directed to a more governed satisfaction of the Rajasic ego. So here is a very interesting passage. Sri Aurobindo is really talking about cases of possession, you know, where um, greater vital beings uh, can actually fill the nature and make one feel that that is who they are. So it is, as he says, that the, the normal condition of the human, this mental being, uh, makes a collusion with the physical and to some extent with the vital so the vital and physical are parts of its own compound existence but if it were to put its entire concentration on the vital then the vital energies invade it and then uh, this part is where he's talking about some kind of a full entry of some sort of a much larger being into the vital being and then that becomes the person. The person starts expressing the capacities of that larger vital being and here he's talking about the Asura or the Rakshasa. So this Asuric and Rakshasic beings possess uh, the individual through the vital and start acting on the earth with its, as he says, this colossal uh, ambitions and blind uh, sort of desires. And he also gives this notion of the Asuric tapasya. See, so, so the mind can also develop itself, but with this vital expansion as the center. So the mind serves it. The body also serves it. That becomes the primary uh, power. And um, if the mind serves it, then the mind develops its own concentration and serves this kind of Asuric being. Uh, with its own type of tapasya. That's, that's, those are the kinds that one hears of uh, in Puranic stories, etc., where you actually find that they even develop a um, very high level of yogic tapasya uh, because they can control uh, the forces and turn them to their own desires. It reminds us of Hitler here. And many others like that, who essentially um, called into themselves uh, forces that were much bigger than the normal human. Um, just a question uh, in this context. Um, is there a difference between um, the um, kind of 
obeying obeying the falsehood uh, versus uh, you know concentrating on the life force i mean the vital for by vital being so what Sri Aurobindo is saying over here is that if the mental being takes that particular form of consciousness to be the center of its existence, if it takes matter, for example, then mind starts acting in matter, taking a materialized mind to be its limit condition. But if it pulls itself out of that and focuses on the life energies as its primary um, container, primary medium of uh, existence, then what it does is that it starts dwelling on these vital energies and their natural expansion, see their natural way of expression and expansion. And in that state, uh, the limitations of the body uh, start becoming hazy, see? And the vital energies normally are these more universal, large and colossal energies. They become magnified in the being. And through that magnification, it is the self, as it were, that draws to itself some magnified vital being. Okay. Now, this could happen in another way if there was not that exclusive concentration on the vital and its powers by the mind, you see. So here he's taking each one of them separately uh, as a certain kind of uh, existence that we identify with. If we are identifying with the vital at the cost of the physical and the mental, it's the mind that's doing it, but it's doing it at the cost of the mental and the physical, then it experiences the vital as the natural condition of its physical existence. And therefore, it is going to draw into it the larger beings of the vital world. So you are saying that it will be more prone to falsehood uh, but I'm just saying, I'm just trying to differentiate between the vital um, predominance and the falsehood. Two are two separate things, right? Yeah, it would seem so. Uh, but as he's saying, the rajasic ego. So if we, if we spiritualize our vital existence, right, the natural condition, if we go into this sort of uh, vital uh, existence with our ego, uh, we vitalize our ego as well. But on the other hand, if we go into this condition and try to spiritualize the ego, then we may have another kind of vital existence. And that's what he is going to discuss in the next paragraph. The natural uh, condition is normally not to spiritualize the ego, but just to take the vital to be one's ego. That's where one draws these asuric beings into oneself because it's the magnification of the ego that occurs. But if one is conscious to turn the ego into a spiritualized kind of vital, you see, so the, the opening to the higher vital beings perhaps requires a different kind of uh, attitude of the ego, so to say. I mean, I was also thinking of like certain characters which when Mother Shravinda were in their bodies, they tried to work on those and where, and say, suppose their vital is very, um, you know, um, uh, upfront and coming front, uh, coming to the front and very powerful. Um, I mean, even if that person is not as conscious, but I'm saying like, I don't exactly no, know the what I'm, yeah. Yeah, none that, that's possible. I mean, all these things are, can be worked on, but they, he's just taking a hypothetical case where somebody is plunging into the vital as the foundational experience and bringing those energies into one's ego as the natural condition of one's existence. 
this is one case that he's taking up. Soon key. Um, the the question the question uh, the Keka asked right now. I think the, the my recent reading of Life Divine, I remember the Shurabindo said the outer vital is naturally drawn to the uh, egocentric kind of uh, egocentric thing. So it kind of a natural natural consequence is gonna be egoic and rajasic and you know rajasic at the end. Uh, but and as I remember, Shurabindo said. The only way to uh, the only way to avoid that avoid that is going going into the inner vital, yeah. inner vital, and then inner vital is still still in the realm of ignorance, mixed mixed realm of ignorance and knowledge. But still, that's the way. That's the only way to uh, the only way, uh, with which we can go in to our soul. And that's my, that, 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 I think that's my understanding of Shurabindo. And uh, here, my confusion is, my confusion is like uh, inner vital, it's kind of a terminology, confusion in the term, Shurabindo's terms. Inner vital, vital being, vital soul, and vital body. So when Shurabindo said uh, vital being, vital being, I thought that's, oh, is that Purusha? And the uh, inner vital being, oh, is that Purusha too? So uh, <laughs> the vital soul, the vital being, vital body, vital nature, and uh, inner and outer, outer of those. Yeah, <laughs> so, so, so when he uses yeah. the term inner vital, that is also part of the Prakriti, not the Purusha. The inner vital oh. and the outer vital are both parts of Prakriti, not Purusha. Now, Sri Aurobindo also, to confuse you even further, Sri Aurobindo also uses the term true vital. Yes. True, but the true vital is the vital purusha that is in contact with the universal vital. So there is a universal vital purusha. So that true vital I was talking about, actually, I'm just think I was just thinking that you know there is another counterpart, like which is that true vital that you just uh, described. Yeah. Which is also a possibility. Of course, it will not be called ego, but I'm yeah. just saying like the That's ego right. could yeah. go into that direction exactly. also. Exactly. If the ego sort of relinquishes itself to the vital purusha and comes into contact with the true vital, which is really, one may say, the cosmic vital purusha. In the Vedic image, Varuna. Mm -hmm. Varuna is a god of the cosmic vital. So if we say that there is a certain kind of an experience of that, and there is a merging of the individual vital purusha with that, then that is the spiritual possibility of the vital. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be a, like a bhivuti of uh, Varuna or something. Could be. Mm. Could be. So um, perhaps in the next paragraph, he's going to move in that di direction, the, the spiritualized um, vital existence. Yes, Linda. Quick question. I thought that uh, the inner vital and the true vital were the same. Uh, haven't I seen that before? No. Oh, my goodness. Because the inner vital, just like Sunki was saying, is a mixed thing. The okay. inner vital is, 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 is also driven by different types of vital forces. But yes, one has to first go into the inner vital to observe it because it has a greater interiority and it can take connects with the vital purusha and the true vital you see that can be transformed by the outer vital doesn't have the interiority to be transformed thank you So I think since we we are at this point and we are close to the end, it'll be good also to read the next paragraph at least. So would uh, Justin, would you like to read the next paragraph? 
I want to thank the previous readers for their wonderful and very thoughtful readings. It's been really great to hear people speak. I'm really grateful for it. And this is, uh, but for the vital plane, is this uh, the, the, the passage that we're speaking about? Yes. But for the vital plane, also it is possible, even as on the physical, to rise to a certain spiritual greatness in its own kind. It is open to the vital man to lift himself beyond the conceptions and energies natural to the desire soul and the desire plane. He can develop a higher mentality and, within the conditions of the vital being, concentrate upon some realization of the spirit or self behind or beyond its forms and powers. In this spiritual realization, there would be a less strong necessity of quietism, for there would be a greater possibility of an active effectuation of the bliss and power of the eternal mightier and more self-satisfied powers, a richer flowering of the dynamic infinite. Nevertheless, that, it, that effectuality could never come anywhere near to a true and integral perfection, for the conditions of the desire world are like those of the physical improper to the development of the complete spiritual life. The vital being, too, must develop a spirit to the detriment of his fullness. Activity and force of life in the lower hemisphere of our existence and turn, in the end, away from the vital formula, away from either to the silence or to an ineffable power beyond them. If he does not withdraw from life, he must remain enchained by life, limited by his self-fulfillment, by the downward pull of the, the desire world and its dominant rajasic principle. On the vital plane also, in its own right alone, a perfect perfection is impossible. The soul at that attains only so far would have to return to the physical life for a greater experience, a higher self-development, a more direct ascent to the spirit. Yes, so what Sri Aurobindo is saying there is that yes, it is possible for a certain kind of a vital spiritualized expression to take place. But this spiritualized exp expression is not the integral expression, and it is partial. And hence, you know, either there is a certain necessity to go beyond to some other principle, which is the origin and root of the vital principle, or in the interim, one has to come back to the physical and develop it further so that the vital can express through it. Otherwise, there is this kind of disbalance and either uh, the flowering of vital powers that are incomplete or a certain kind of a fall to uh, existence that is incapable of expressing the vital energies. Janita. Um, am I reading <clears throat> am I reading too much into it, but is Sri Aurobindo saying that is talking about rebirths, taking the human form again and again, because the journey is arduous and it takes a very long time for us where we are sandwiched between the physical and the spiritual for our ego, which according to Jungian psychology is the is the agency uh, is the agency for transformation. Uh, but for this ego to walk the path from the physical to the inner vital to the outer vital to the true vital 
is what I understood. Uh, and this whole uh, path uh, takes many rebirths. Uh, and it's like, maybe I wouldn't like to use the word taming, not taming, which has a different connotation, but, but uh, maybe an alignment uh, of the ego or a fine tuning of the ego uh, along this path that it reaches the true vital uh, uh, leaving, uh, you know, kind of shedding all its earthly um, pulls uh, uh, and all that heaviness and everything that surrounds it and, and to keep rising because the ego is, is the agency of transformation. And yeah, uh, yeah I hope I... Anita, so that, yeah. Or what the ego itself in, in Sri Aurobindo's case would get transformed by the psychic being. In other words, it would become the psychic being. And you're right in that uh, there is definitely a suggestion, particularly at the end of rebirths, that one would, you know, this process that he's talking about is not necessarily attained in a single life, but one would have to come back to something or go somewhere else in another life if one doesn't it doesn't happen in, in a single life it it could the accelerated pro process of yoga could make it go faster than normal existence but still the sense of rebirths is definitely present in in this uh, chapter i think um, well, sorry, can I say yeah, something really yes, quick? Yes, um, because yes, it's so much pertaining to what Janita said. That, um, so when um, when we, I mean, we are body born, then um, the only part that comes to the next uh, birth is what has been psychicized, right? The vital part, like the very uh, which is around forms around the psychic being. But um, the other thing that is, um, you know, this desire force, etc., that vital, you know, which is which gets involved into that uh, vital energy and uh, desire force, does that uh, continue to the next birth, or is it drawn from the universal again? So the, uh, the, the some of this is a little obscure in Sri Aurobindo and the Mother. But basically what I get from them is that the traces of whatever one experiences are there in the Purusha itself, in the psychic being. So mm -hmm. whatever experience one took and where one stopped or what one couldn't achieve is continued through <laughs> other experiments by the psychic being in the next life. So that um, that stamp or whatever that um, yeah um, some kind of a stamp it, it, or trace can can that be called as part of that inner uh, envelope that has been yes. formed around yes. the psychic being yes yes so so basically what I'm trying to say is that the the dynamic very you know um, what should I say well like very in in um, occupy, I mean, involved into the, this, uh, you know, desire force, the vital energy of the universe, etc. That part, is it the same as that stamp part that is kind of an inner and beloved of the psychic being? Um, no, what, what it which... is that the psychic being keeps a record of what it has experienced. See? Therefore, if a certain type of experience has been completed, mm -hmm. you know, and the psychic has has got control over it, then that becomes part of that envelope that you're talking about. But if it mm -hmm. hasn't, mm -hmm. in other words, whatever it has experienced needs completion in some other way, it keeps the traces by which it continues that kind of work. Yeah. So that it sure, uh, yeah, but it, it takes the vital again out of the universal vital yeah. and on that it applies that wisdom that it has right. gathered right? Right. Mm -hmm. wow. 
yeah, just in response to that, I think of it as an imprint, like something that isn't that, that an experience is imprinted, yeah. even if it isn't completed. So you still have very much the sense of it. Um, what I wanted to ask was just um, this last part when it says on the vital plane of perfect perfection is impossible. The soul that attains only so far would have to return to the physical life for greater experience. But if if a, a greater physical uh, experience on the physical plane has already been accomplished by a particular soul, um, and then this is after that, um, the you know the experiences on the vital plane come after that then you can just keep going, right? I mean, you wouldn't have to return to the physical plane. Yes. The, the right? completion, you're right. The completion is talking about over here, uh, the, the incompleteness of the vital experience. You see, in the Bhrigus Tapasya, that's why it doesn't stop at the vital, even though it recognizes a certain infinity of the vital, the, yes. the Brahman of the vital. Because the fulfillment of the vital is like the fulfillment of the, all the other planes yeah. material vital and 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 mental is in the higher hemisphere that's why he starts by talking about the two hemispheres mm -hmm. and in the life divine as you know he's pointing to the fulfillment of each of them the vital the fulfillment of the vital is the plane of chit See, the fulfillment of the physical is the plane of sat. And the fulfillment of the mental is the supermind. So it gives it a hint of its own origin, but then it has to go further. And it's only when it gets to the supermind that it starts experiencing the full fulfillment that these other planes bring to it, um, you know, and complete what uh, remains incomplete in the vital in itself. Thank you. And and that's on that, on that this, is, sorry. sorry. No, I didn't want to interrupt you. I just wanted to uh, ask whether on because you said ego would become the phys the psychic being. On which uh, uh, plane would that be? When on the supramental. No, not not just not just the supramental in even in the normal ignorance, the ego, okay. which is really a shadow, at in Sri Aurobindo's view, the ego is a shadow cast by the psychic being. Okay. So the psychic so the, the difference between the ego and the psychic being in Sri Aurobindo's terminology is that the psychic being and the ego are both individual and unique, but the ego doesn't have the property of knowing its unity with others. It's always exclusive to itself. Okay. The sense of separation continues in, in, in our experience. While to psychic being, there is uniqueness, but the knowledge of the same everywhere. So in in this terminology at least the psychic being is the truth of the ego and the ego is therefore right. replaced by the psychic <clears throat> being aha uh -huh. uh, it is the truth of the ego yes could could we go as <clears throat> even further to say that uh, that it would uh, eventually erase the desire soul Yes, because the desire soul is really coming, is, an, is the action of the ego to take for oneself as against others. Right. So it, because that it, would, it would eliminate this, this aspect of the soul and free it. Yeah, there, there would be an enjoyment in freedom, you see. Not right. an enjoyment that comes from the knowledge of one's not having something that others have. Right, right, right. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you.
<laughs> what do you say? Uh, the enjoyment of not having something that others have. When a soul, when a psychic being knows how to be uh, calm and contained and 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 joyful in such a state. Yeah, in the sense that uh, one enjoys. Um, when I said what what I meant by not enjoying what others have, meaning that making a comparison and saying that my enjoyment comes from you. You know, we 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 look around and see others as separate from ourselves and as having things that I don't have that breeds competition in me to have those things. You see, that kind of a enjoyment is replaced by the enjoyment of pure enjoyment of knowing of, I mean, that kind of enjoyment, the psychic being enjoys existence primarily just by existing. To exist itself is joyful. And to accept the things of life as enjoyment is natural. But mm -hmm. not accepting, grabbing at things because others have it and I don't have it. That's that's what I mean. That, that's the difference between the enjoyment of the of this of the ego and the enjoyment of the psychic being in terms of this state of separation. We are physically separate in the sense that uh, we, with our senses, experience each other as separate. But with the ego, we take that to be the truth. Mm -hmm. With the psychic being, we know that to be a certain appearance. You know your, your oneness with others, but at the same time, you know that you exist in a separate formulation, which is a unique formulation of the one. You think, uh, uh, and I, 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 you know, if Justin wants to kick in, that's also because Justin is also a Jungian, uh, uh, you know, scholar. Um, would you say that uh, Jung's notion of the self uh, would encompass that kind of an idea as with, you know, uh, yes. compare it so, to the notion of the ego? Uh, uh, the notion of the self as atma is is that the su suggestion here or what aspect of the of this would, would would the notion of the self be something which uh, is, is a kind of a replacement for the exclusivity and separateness of the ego uh, there's an ego self relationship that edward edinger describes uh, so that i mean the 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 ego is present in a in a relationship it's it's merged in an identity in child right. But then develops into a, a, an axis of relationship, right. and not ego self axis, right? The ego self axis. So that is a transformed ego that is actually expressing the universality of the self. It's obscure, but some, maybe it's it's like it's, that, yeah? it's left. It's left the primary identification. It's yeah. left some yogic uh, relationship to the self and has entered into uh, its its own seerness. Right. By having the ego self access, there's this, the seer as manifest. Yeah. That's nice. So I, th I think it's yeah. worth uh, thinking because I think uh, there's a different terminology being used by Jung, but there are ways by which we can look at the systems, um, you know, in comparison. Elementary. Uh, from what I understand, the ego self access by Edinger clearly defines that initially the ego and the self are together. That's the first stage, but that's an unconscious stage. Mm, right. That unconscious. And then there's the separation of the ego and the self, right? When you come into adulthood. Mm. And that's a very important stage to become an individual. Right, to know your ego and to be able to think consciously as a first. And then it finally it is the ego and the self, uh, the interdependence, the universality, 
the oneness, but that's a conscious oneness, very different from the oneness which was there in the initial stage of unconsciousness. So to arrive at it through awareness and consciousness is the is the last step. Right. But isn't, isn't it surrender that's sort of the mechanism that takes you there? Yeah, for the psychic being, it is definitely one of its primary characteristic is surrender. Hmm. And I, I'm not sure about the, you know, ego self axis or how exactly Jung works it out. But um, I think you, we don't need to see identity, but there are compatibilities. Just a very quick uh, clarification question to Justin, please. When you said the seer, is manifest. You meant the uh, you meant to see it as the witness. Is that right? Is that You're correct? Muted, the drishi, the the seer, the drashtir, the one who sees. Yes, I yeah. think something. There's a witnessing presence that's in that see that, and that that is manifest through the the separation of the that false identification at the beginning of the of the process, the the projective identification. Yeah, this what? seer and witness of the field corresponds to what in our Aurobindonian uh, um, tenets? Uh, I'd what? be interested to find what Debashish would say about the yes. dress here. And what? what is? I don't know at this point. I, I, I'm interested in finding out myself. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's interesting because, you know, Jung has drawn heavily on Gnostic sources. And a lot of this has got Gnostic background, mystical and Gnostic background to it. And so it, it is interesting to see exactly how, what he has drawn on, what is the background of his uh, understanding of these things. Sunki? Um, this is just actually this is my question. You know, uh, I read some books about psychology and including Jung, and what actually that one is, uh, yeah. So uh, there, I, the one I remember is the, the the author said that in Jung, uh, in Jung, it's impossible to think about think of consciousness without ego, but in Indian yoga psychol in yoga philosophy, consciousness. I mean the higher all consciousness, including the higher and highest consciousness, that those all range of consciousness, and I mean especially higher consciousness, is possible uh, with, without ego. So uh, the author said that's the very big difference between the Jungian and the, uh, the Indian and also Aurobindian uh, psychology. Am I, is, that, is my understanding correct? There are two distillations of this. There are two distillations. Uh, marriage as a psychological relationship is an essay by Jung where he describes precisely that it has to be a consciousness of. But in the second location, you can find throughout the Red Book of Jung, non-intentional awareness being given true preference. The non-intentional, but all of the intentional awareness and the, the consciousness, is it's in marriage as a psychological relationship, which is also critical for understanding and uh, really the East-West connection in this so uh, I, I, yeah, it is a it is a, a complex issue. Um, again, it it's not so easy to talk about um, you know ego in the Jungian sense because these are words that are being used specifically, and exactly what is the content has to be carefully uh, seen. And even when we are talking about we don't need ego to have consciousness in the East. Yes, that is true, but if by ego we are talking about the unique individual, then in Sri Aurobindo's and the mother's view, um, the experience of consciousness by the unique individual is at the center of it. You see, mm -hmm. so in a way, you know, what we are talking about, um, the supermind, the supermind as a consciousness exists, whether we exist or not. And the supermind of the consciousness can be experienced by us, whether we experience in an individual way or not. But 
to experience it in an individual way is the triple transformation. We are supposed to individualize the experience even of the supermind. So there is a place, very important place. Thanks. That's why the psychic being is at the very center of Sri Aurobindo and the mother's teaching. There's a place where the mother says very clearly that it is the psychic that becomes supramentalized. So it is a unique individual experience of these planes of consciousness. They can be had without the individual experience, but that's not what the yoga of Sri Aurobindo is about. It's a quick line that um, uh, it's also depends on uh, the terminology uh, yeah. that uh, I mean, generally a little bit of reading Western, um, you know, philosophy and psychology. It seems that the in the West, uh, the usage of the term ego goes quite far. I mean, it's not necessarily bound to what we call ego, uh, ego in our yogic terms. I mean, so in that's Indian why I yogic said terms. You have to look at exactly what is the content because I think these are subtle concepts and they have fuzzy boundaries. And that's how we have to understand it. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I think um, Justin is drawing attention to Dr. Ian Witcher, who talks about non-intentional awareness. Asam Pagyan. Okay, I think that's good for today. Let's resume next week. It's good to see all of you. It's so good to see everyone. Thank nice to so be much. back together. Thank you so much. Thank and you. as they say, we had a wild finish. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Thank yes. Welcome. Thank Everyone. you so much. And looking Thank forward to this. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.